Well, thanks, Paul, for the invitation, and Steve and Chris and the others that dobbed me in. Um, it's really nice to come to, to a different uni and a, a different audience, although I see some familiar faces around the place. Um, and so that what I'm going to talk about today is, is not by any means a, a well-established piece of science. It's not some nice... Uh, detail, or a nice piece of work that's been you know, chugged over in lots of detail, it has a whole heap of supporting threads. Instead, it's really just an idea. Um, and it's an idea that has been sort of morphing in my mind over the course of a year or two of looking at porphyries around the world. Um, and so I'll be interested to know what you make of it. Actually, read that. Part of this is, or part of the idea, directly refutes stuff that I've trotted out for other companies in the past by virtue of how I would guide exploration for porphyry copper deposits. Um, and so I stumbled upon this the other day and I thought it was kind of cute. But it captures that idea that as explorers, even as scientists, we really shouldn't be too hung up on what we believe at any one point in time. Um, and so, what, again, just to, to hammer the point that what I'll present is, is really just part of me thinking out loud. So, as explorers, we are constantly told, well, you want to find elephants, you go to elephant country. And where's elephant country? Well, of course, it's this area over here. Everyone, there's no elephants in, um, in Angola, clearly. But turns out there's also elephants over here. And there used to be elephants, well, we might ask the question as to what happened to the rest of India, because I'm sure they, they, they weren't entirely that limited. And there are two questions here. One, of course, is do we really know why, why they are where they are? Do we know what controls the boundaries of things like this, which in this particular case is information? Do we know what controls the boundaries such as these, which might be something which has happened independent of the poor elephants themselves? And if we recognise that these are all tropical climates and they're all around the equator and they all span savanna and rainforest, well then, why the hell are there no elephants over here and over here? And there might be good reasons for that. But that's the question we've got to ask. So if we're looking for big porphyry copper deposits, where should we go? We've been asked this by various companies over the years. And this is a map showing some pretty gross outlines of arc terrains around the world, coloured up by their contained copper. Now, they're not all arc terrains, clearly. They're just geological domains coloured up by copper. And so there are obvious things. There's bits of Chile that light up as having a hell of a lot of copper. Something like 40-odd 40, 40 percent of the world's copper is concentrated in the Central Andean crust. Um, bits of North America look pretty good. And there's a whole range of other things there that might lead you down the path of saying, well, there's a prospect over here in this part of New Guinea. Should we go and look there? And I've heard people jump up and down and scream at me at why we shouldn't go there because there's no precedent, because no one's found anything world-class there yet. Is that glass half empty or is it half full? There's a question about opportunity that should get raised every time we see a map like this that says, this is what we know, therefore this is all that there is to know. So is this a map of where to explore? Not specifically. This is a map of where you might go to learn what actually constitutes the right place to go looking. And so we'll start with the Andes because this talk is a, was, um, was framed as a comparison between Andean and Arcs. And at least in my thought process, we started out with the idea, or I started out with the idea, that the Andes was the bee's knees, and therefore the Andes is the place you want to really understand. <coughs> so, so here are some sections of the sections, some sketch sections through the, the central Andes, picking in time, you know, frame from the Jurassic pretty much to, to the present, more or less. And what are, some big picture comments about the tectonic environment in the Andes. That there's been persistent subduction over quite a long period. The Western, then Western Gondwana margin became a subducting convergent margin actually a bit before that time, probably about 280 or 300 million years ago. Um, it didn't really get going as a subduction margin as we would understand it these days until 200. But it's just been going and going and going in roughly the same place. This upper plate section here has been cratinized pretty much throughout that period. And we might, we'll come back to this accretionary history after. And there's been a very distinct period of compression from about 50 million years onwards. 
Importantly, it's been subaerial for most of that period, and there's been the compression and the orogenesis and the formation of the Andean mountain range has happened without obvious collision of any other continental fragments. Compression ultimately kills arcs. So there's a, a series of sections here that I've pinched that again just step through in time and what we see, just walk through these, is the subducting plate migrating, subduction erosion going on. This thing started out back, back here somewhere. It's so compressive, it's ripping off bits of the upper plate and shunting them down the slab, down the, um, the subduction zone. And magnetism ceases because of the inter arc compression. At some point, it'll step and magnetism will start again. But the long and the short of it is that the Andean history, at least the Cenozoic Andean history, is one of intra arc compression and of the magma production being mostly dominated by the stress condition within the arc. Every now and again, some of that magma makes it to the surface, but the vast bulk of the magma that's generated never sees the light of day. Here's a quite a, well, it should be a fairly famous diagram looking at magma chemistry for that 200 million year history of the Andes, at least the central Andes, and pointing out that there seems to be some cyclicity to how magmas evolve. So we're looking at lanthanum and meterbium, taken by these authors as a proxy for the thickness of the across the upper plate section and the depth of magma equilibration. Basically, if it's deep enough that there's garnet in the, in the residue, the ytterbium sequestered in the garnet, and this ratio goes up. And what they show is this thing that ramps and ramps and ramps and ramps and then whoop, and re is reset. And it ramps and ramps and ramps and whoop, and it's reset. Turns out there's, a, there's another cycle in here that is flagged by those alkaline rocks, resets, comes up again, resets, comes up again. So we can put in the simplified positions of what appear roughly correlated with compressive events when the re when the, as the most extreme chemical anomaly happens and then when the resetting happens. This correlates quite happily with the isotopic composition of the rocks such that they become progressively more crustally contaminated in each one of those events. And the same we can look at in neodymium terms. So there's a very consistent relationship here between the chemistry of the rocks throughout the central Andes with these four, or as I suggested, a fifth cycle. Come back to here again. So what's, what's going on here? There's, there's two bits to this. One is clearly that this, this ramping seems to, or at least the upper extreme seems to creep up and then reset. But there's also a cumulative cycle so that each step becomes, the chemical anomaly becomes more extreme than the step before it and each step more extreme than the one before that, and so on and so forth. So there's a cyclical and accumulative behavior. So my main composition changes in time, and there are repeated periods that I'm going to argue are related to intra arc compression, through which there's both a cyclical change in chemistry and a cumulative change throughout the history of the arc. Something about the character of the magma generated in the Andes gets increasingly extreme as time goes on. If we superimpose the amount of copper in the Andes on, on that diagram, this red line here, it's, um, the numbers are basically right back to about this sort of point in time and then it's just schematic before that. What you see there is a correlation between the amount of copper concentrated in porphyry copper deposits in the central Andes and the, and the magma chemistry. For this Eocene cycle here, the magma chemistry picks up and then all of a sudden the, the amount of copper concentrated or hell breaks loose and then it resets. And in the, um, in, the, in the Oligocene and the Miocene, the same thing happens. It creeps up and then all of a sudden there's this almost catastrophic, if you like, um, emergence or concentration of copper in the shallow crust. There's a smaller event back here in the, in the Paleocene and smaller events coinciding with 
um, more subtle tecton tectonism around about 90 million years and again in the Cretaceous, in the early Cretaceous. So take this as evidence, or I take this as evidence, that this intra-arc compression and the compressive tectonism within the Andes is, is a key part of the process for the copper metallogeny. We can zoom in on just one of those periods of time. This is just the Eocene. Um, we've got, I'll just start, chuck on a couple, of, um, a couple of deposits that have been drilled out in more detail since this diagram was made. And from 43 MA to 31, MA, we can see there's this sort of, it's bouncy, but there's general increase in the size of the deposits and the number of big deposits. There's like the maturum, I could have plotted other, other criteria, I could have plotted strontium on yttrium, I could have plotted vanadium on scandium or strontium on zirconia or a bunch of other things that have been published as, as proxies for, for this process. And they all show the same general coincidence with, with the fertility for copper. How does that come about? Well, this is probably the best example I've seen of pointing out maybe why that happens. And it has to do with compression and storage of magma um, in the deep part of the lith lithosphere. The basic, long and the short of it, the more magma you can store down there, the greater volume from which you can distill the key volatile components and, and the key metals. And there are various lines of evidence now for suggesting that Porphyry copper deposits form from magmas that are the end product of quite um, extensive fractional crystallization. Um, clearly, the greater the compression, these arrows in here, then the greater the force that needs to be overcome by buoyancy of the magma for intrusion and for ascent into the shallow environment. So the more compression, the more magma, the bigger the tank, the more volatiles you can condense or you can distill into a small volume. So, hence the, the genetic relationship between compression and lots of copper. So what we've got here are some, some summaries of tectonic parameters for the Andes. So I've said, I've said that I like compression. I think compression is a big part of the story. But if you take the shortening rate, and this is calculated from a whole series of balanced cross-sections across the central Andes, um, a compilation work out of the um, University in Potsdam from a few years back, what we see is the, these pink domains are the, the main metallogenic events in the central Andes. And the main compressive phase kicks off a, a bit after 50 million years. And it comes along, and it's long and short of the whole thing's compressive. There's no obvious response here that this particular increase in compression coincides with mineralization, or this increase, those two might. But here's a metallogenic event that has no noticeable change in the intra arc compression. There's one here that seems to be happening where the compression's waning even. So it doesn't seem quite as simple as the idea that you just need more compression to, to make more copper. We look at some other things. We look at the, um, the rate of convergence. This is the black line or the obliquity of convergence, the yellow line. And clearly there are times and places where big porphyry copper deposits form where the convergence is relatively fast and there are times when it happens when convergence is relatively slow. There are times when it happens when the convergence is oblique. There are times when it's less oblique. So none of those first order parameters are very useful to us. What appears to be the key is changes in those parameters. So this green line here is taken as the, the rate of, basically the, the rate of rollback, the rate of hinge motion in the trade-off between the upper plate and the lower plate. The convergence must be absorbed either by subduction erosion or hinge rollback. So here's the rate <coughs> of hinge motion and here's the rate at which it's changing. And the places when the hinge motion changes, when we go from something steady state to something which is different, either it starts rolling back or it starts becoming a flat slab environment, that's the point in time at which the major mineral, mineral events happen in the central Andes. So we need compression and we need changing strain rate, to, in my view at least, to allow these deeply, um, deeply ponded magmas and their derivative products to make it into the shallow environment. So that's, that's my view of Andean systems. And we took that view and ran around the world trying to use it to find other porphyries and to find other belts of rock that might have had a similar history. And what we found didn't really fit that picture at all. On this plot, what I've got, I've, I've put the Andes down here for reference. And here's that same plot of the amount of copper. These other lines are much more schematic 
um, but they're indicative of the, of the amount of metal concentrated at each point in time. For three other arcs, here's the Western Tethian, and by Western I'm taking the bit from Turkey and westwards. Um, Cordillera in North America, and by that I'm talking really about British Columbia uh, and the Central Asian Orogenic Belts. And in each case, we don't see this, this Andean pattern of a bit of copper, a bit more copper, a bit more copper, and then a lot of this increasingly, this cumulative sense of copper delivery into the crust. We see almost the opposite. We see oh, there's a few VMSs happening, but then there's a big event, and then there's a couple of progressively smaller events. There's a big event and a series of progressively smaller events, and in Central Asia there's a couple of big events, and then there's not a hell of a lot goes on through the Mesozoic until, until the craton stabilizes. So off the bat, the fundamental observation here that I'm presenting is that this idea of a cumulative improvement in metallogeny in the Andes is not something that is borne out in, in some of these other belts around the world. And these are belts that have really substantial copper deposits in them. Um, and so we're not talking about tiddlywink deposits. We're not talking about mixing or not necessarily comparing apples and oranges. Here. Um, there's something seriously different about what I thought I knew about the Andes and some of these other belts that have serious porphyry copper systems. So what's going on? So the first point to notice is that those three belts of rock that I was mentioning are all belts that are, I guess, well known as accretionary margins, hence the name. And they start out almost to, a, to an example they start out with this funny interplay between a convergent margin that's also being rifted at the same time. So if we look at this little, in, oh, here's the timings up, upside down. So here's the late Permian and here's the Jurassic. There's 100 million years between these two pictures. It's, it's an important 100 million years. In this little corner of the world in here, it's almost the, the, the crux, if you like, of this um, Paleotethian <laughs> subduction margin. It's a convergent margin. There's subduction going on under the now assembled Central Asian continental landmass. But at the same time, it's trying to rip itself apart. The Central Atlantic Magmatic Province is trying to open at the same time. It's trying to be pulled apart at the same time as it's trying to be a, sub a subducting margin. And that's very much the, the origin of all of these accretionary margins. In a little bit more detail, this is the same area, just zooming in series of different time slices from 230 down to 120 million years. And you can see the central Atlantic rifting propagating through here at the same time as there are incipient or um, subduction zones that are rolling back. So it's, it's a fairly confused tectonic scenario from the outset. And the end product of that seems to be quite substantially fragmented microcontinental arrays. So this is the same area, um, and we're looking at, here's the Moesian platform, which is now Romania and northern Bulgaria. Here's the Rhodope and the Srednagori zone, which is southern Bulgaria and Greece. Here's the Sakaria continent, which makes up a chunk of western Turkey. Um, these are little, little bits of continent. Um, some of them are um, para-autochthonous from continental eastern Europe. Some of these things are genuinely allochthonous and have been hived off North Africa. So we have this very complex archipelago um, setup of both autochthonous and, um, and allochthonous continental fragments. And amongst all of that, there's a lot of rifting going on. There's still some subduction going on in places. And there's a lot of rocks that get described as being arc grabens or back arcs that never have an arc. The, the, the kind of conventional geometry we think of as a, as a clean subduction zone with a clear magmatic front and then a back arc behind it seems very hard to determine in this environment because it's so messy. Here's another view of the same margin from north to south going through, um, through what's now modern Greece. And I'm not going to even pretend to understand this or explain it except to point out the number of fragments of continent, of crust the number of little ocean basins. This thing is being just ripped up into a squid in little pieces. And that seems to be um, a bit of a recurring theme as well. In looking at these accretion margins around the world, one of the things I noticed uh, 
is this recurrent association with super subduction zone, SSZ ophiolites. It's just a little an observation of regional geology that I've that I've seen in, in many of these accretionary margins. As defined, super, super subductions and ophiolites are those that typically have a well-preserved tect tectonostratigraphic section of um, sheeted dike zones and volcanics um, under that cumulate ultramorphic rocks, and that there's a whole slew of associated rock suites from island arc tholeites to genuine back arc basalts um, to things that look more like boninites. And I guess the idea there, as, as laid out in the schematic, is and, and herein lies part of the story of why the back arcs and the arcs are hard to differentiate, is because it's, they're really one and the same thing, that we're seeing rifting along the main arc front. And so where we would normally draw the conventional textbook line between what's an arc and what's a back arc becomes very confused. Um, this looks like, an, as, as it's drawn, looks like an arc, but now all of a sudden we're seeing so much mantle flow that we're seeing rifting of the arc front itself. Um, and at some point, that thing creates its own little landmass which is abducted um, and subduction reinitiates somewhere else. You could, we can argue about why that might be the case, but as a, just as a first pass observation, most of these accretionary arcs seem to have um, well preserved ophiolites in them. So we'll, we'll wander through a couple of other examples. Um, the same ones I used before. So here's, here's um, the northwestern margin of Pangaea in, um, in the early Permian. And I've jumped straight to a point at which all of these terrains have been hived off already from the, um, from the Pangaean margin. And what's known as the Slide Mountain Basin has opened. As we wander through there, it does a U-turn. Slide Mountain Basin closes. Keep your eye on this position here, because all of a sudden, the subduction polarity flips under that margin as it docks. And then we get this massive flare up in porphyry copper metallogeny right along the Stikine and Quinell terrains in, in that part of the world. Note that the metallogeny includes not just conventional porphyry copper deposits, includes alkalic porphyry copper systems, it includes a series of syngenetic things, um, sediment hosted deposits of various, of various styles. If we look at Central Asia, similar idea, series of um, reconstructions, of which I can take my credit. Um, start out with something which is rifting little pieces of the continent at the same time as it has a subducting margin. Locally makes impressive porphyry deposits. That process continues. There's yet more rifting. Again, we see syngenetic mineralization. And locally, we see impressive porphyry deposits. Keep your eye on that position because subduction has flipped underneath this part of the, um, the arc in what's now Kazakhstan, and we see a massive flare-up in porphyry copper metallogeny. This is a fairly diachronous event through here, and so the, the metallogeny is protracted through the, the latter part of the Devonian into the Carboniferous. And then the thing stabilizes, and there's still porphyries being emplaced, but they're not as large, and the, the metallogenic uh, events subsequent to that are not as significant. So, again, the metallogeny includes both alkali and calcalic porphyry copper styles. It includes syngenetic deposit styles. And at least in this part of the world, it includes slate belt gold in, in the accretionary prisms associated with these belts. It's quite different to the Andean environment where we see subaerial environments, porphyries, high sulfidation epithermal deposits, and really very little else by way of the range of deposit styles. As before, this is really there just to impress upon you the dizzying array of geometries that seems to um, evolve in these environments. This is one relatively recent take on part of the Central Asian orogenic belt. We're running from 470 million years down to 300. The point to make here is that the big ticket mineralization event happens at about this time, which is pretty much when there's a lot of microcontinental docking and subduction polarity reversal going on. So as a recap, the key characteristics, in my view, of accretionary arcs at a, at a tectonic scale are that they're belts that are dominated by highly fragmented crustal material um, and quite thinned 
by, by virtue of this extensional history, quite thin um, upper plate. I don't know why it seems to be important, but purely as an observation, that includes both allochthonous and autochthonous blocks. There are multiple, multiple arcs and back arcs with ambiguous pairings and trying to pull these with a modern tangle of bits of crust and bits of arc and ophiolite and actually make sense of it almost defies uh, a logical conclusion in many cases, as that last slide for the Central Asian Belt shows. Um, there's obvious subduction or notable subduction reversals in many cases and abduction with preserved ophiolites. In terms of mineral deposits, the main copper event is early. That's the, the, big, the big observation for my part. Um, there's an association of porphyries with VMS, often quite close in time. You can go to places like Chowapech in Bulgaria for which, from where this diagram is taken. Now, the diagrams that point out that there's sedimentation happening above the magmatic system um, at the same time as the hydrothermal system is, is active. Chowapech is an interesting spot because it's a high sulfidation system that overprints a bunch of um, basically a pyritic uh, VMS with black smoker chimney fragments in it. Um, but it formed within a million years or so of the Alatste Porphyry just down the road, which is a, a sizable copper, moderate gold, minor platinum group metal, but basically a copper porphyry. Um, so making the point that VMSs and porphyries are not mutually exclusive in this environment, where in the Andes you'd probably say that that, that statement would hold true. Um, what else do we see? Locally slate belt gold um, and alkalic porphyry styles. Notably, and again, this diagram from Chowapech bears out the point that the porphyries are emplaced into, or at least in many cases, are emplaced at the same time as sedimentation is going on. This idea that rifting that would normally be assigned to a back arc environment has migrated into the arc front, so we're seeing the formation of a, a quote unquote arc graben, as much as I dislike that term. Um, we see this association very frequently. Um, classically, in Eastern Europe, in, in, um, in Serbia, for example, really obvious domain of rocks with obvious normal faults on the margins and a sedimentary package which is not developed outside of that at the same time as the volcanism um, that's associated with the mineralization. So why the difference? So borrowing really heavily from, from Bob Laux here, Andean arcs are premier copper terrains because copper is an evolved property of the magnets associated with the deposits. I'm not going to argue that because I believe it. I think, Bob's done, I think Bob's done a really good job of laying out that case and that evolution to copper fertility comes from the, basically the, the inertia, if you, if you like, of, of the Andean arc. It's big, thick, heavy upper plate, or sorry, light upper plate. It's almost impenetrable. There's lots of magma gets stored there. And so there's lots of opportunity for the magnets to evolve so long as they're hydrous, so long as they're oxidized, um, to evolve to copper fertility. So here's a section through the Andes. Um, and yeah, there's some structural permeability out here in the sub-Andean ranges in Argentina, but there's not much magma production out there. There's a little bit of structural permeability through here in the Precordillera. And that's about it. The rest of that section is dominated in, in, in big um, seismic sections shot across the Andes. The, the rest of that margin is dominated by flat structures. It's fairly difficult for a magma coming off the slab down here somewhere to actually make its way up through that section. So what happens? We set re repeated metasomatism of the same lithosphere. There's very few structural channels for ascent of that magma. And on the whole, we see stronger upper plate and lower plate coupling and uh, compression. Lots and lots of thrust duplexes and, um, and terrain generation uh, in board of the arc. What about gold? Well, it turns out accretionary arcs are far better at making gold than they are making copper. Gold is a primary feature, or gold enrichment is a primary feature, according to Bob and John and a few others who've worked on the subject. Um, this graph here is really just showing the, um, the differential enrichment of things that are low degree melts of enriched sources, that's to say roughly the same magmas that we find associated with many styles of gold deposits, lamprophires, nasty alkaline rocks. Low degree melts from enriched sources yield things that have very high background gold. So long as they're hydrous, then they're the rocks we need to make gold deposits. 
and part and parcel of that accretionary history of subduction and intra-arc rifting seems to be seems to create exactly the right environment for heat delivery to the sub-arc lithosphere and melting of things that have been metasomatized. So here's a section through British Columbia. It looks rather similar to that Andean margin. It's got some big thrust belt on, in the inboard position. It's got some kind of modern arc with sub-vertical features in, in this area, but the notable point is that this thing here, which is here somewhat glibly called the intermontane block, is actually a mess. It's not a coherent block at all. The subduction zone used to go that way, and at one point it was there, and then something else accreted to bring it back to its modern position out here. So this thing is actually a complete schmozzle of hydrated materials, of bits of ocean crust, little bits of thin continental crust. There's Two things are going on. One is that each time the subduction zone moves around, we metasomatize a different part of the subarc mantle. So there's lots of opportunity for generation and storage and reworking of metasomatized lithosphere, the kind of stuff from which we need to make that low degree melt to, um, to improve the gold fertility of the magmas. And there are multiple structural channels that penetrate through this. So it's rather difficult to store the amount of magma you need to drive really good copper metallogeny. In the Tethian, I think we see some sort of evidence of these processes waxing and waning. This, this slide is, um, you know, the two different lines are two different attempts at calculating the convergence rate, the bulk convergence between Africa and Europe um, from the, the Jurassic to the present. And what you generally see is that it's reasonably high, it drops, it picks up again, drops again, picks up again. In terms of metallogeny, what does that, what does that mean for us? What we see is, as it's dropping through the Jurassic and into the Cretaceous, we have an event dominated by VMS systems. From the early Cretaceous through to the mid and the early part of the latter Cretaceous, compression speeds up, or sorry, convergence speeds up between Africa and Europe. And I'm inferring that as we speed up that the, the convergence, we're increasing compression in the arc. That culminates with a major period of copper metallogeny at Timok and Srednagori. Through the rest of the Cretaceous, convergence relaxes. We see extension and VMS development in the Pontids. There's a little pulse of rapid convergence in the Eocene, again, that coincides with copper metallogeny, in, um, mostly in central Anatolia. And then through Western Turkey and Greece, we see another event dominated by gold and dominated by extensional tectonics as Africa kind of eases back again. So I think we can talk about the metallogeny of these systems in terms of the interplay between compression and extension. And accretionary arcs are quite distinct because they seem to have so much oscillation between the two. So if we look at some, um, some tectonic correlations here, uh, this is the same graph I put up before. What I want to add to it are some key points of continental docking in these systems. So in each of these three arcs that I've used as examples, we see the principal docking event coincides with, this is that long diachronous um, collision in the Central Asian belt. The principal microcontinental docking event coincides with that early major copper event. I'll just jump over that, we don't, don't need to see someone's sketch. Um, there is some degree of correlation in time with major large igneous provinces. So here in, uh, although this is just a bunch of, a, a correlation, uh, compilation, sorry, of, um, of lit times that I grabbed from a paper this morning, um, this is something that only struck me very, very recently. And notably, there are some, some perfect correlations between some of these events and, and some of the, um, the big flare-ups of collision and abduction and metallogeny that we see in these accretionary arcs. And so I'm not suggesting that there's any particular contribution from the lips in terms of components, just that they trigger the system to move faster um, for, for short periods of time. Um, relatively recently, someone went around and counted up the number of major abduction events at each point in time around the world. And again, we see this sometimes perfect, sometimes loose correlation 
between the abduction history of some of these margins and when the mineralization happens, again implying that local collisions within these accretionary margins, so the, the point of accretion and by inference, in some cases, subduction reversal, um, is a key part of what drives the metallogeny. So all of that's to say that accretionary arcs are quite sensitive both to local tectonics and also to, to far-field tectonic environments. I think they're more sensitive to, to far-field environments than, than Andean margins. And that to be predictive, in an Andean sense, that's relatively easy. It just gets better and better and better. And all you need to know is understand the points in time when, when the magma chemistry is changing and you can predict which, which ages of rock in the, in the central Andes are going to be fertile. Um, in, an, in, in accretionary arcs, that's a whole lot more difficult because it's not that simple. It's not as simple as saying, oh, you know, the younger rocks are better. Instead, what we see is this thing where I actually need to understand the history in some detail of each individual arc. I need to try to get a handle on what those microcontinental fragments were, when did they accrete, what sedimentation was happening at the time, and how did that interplay with the volcanism. That stuff is, is important in accretionary arcs, and it's much more difficult. So anyway, this map just shows my rough-as-guts estimate of which arcs, as we generally understand them, um, have the characteristics of accretionary arcs. And we can bolt on there the, the things that look more like Andean margins. And I'll make the point that it's not as simple as saying oh, these, oh, that all I'm describing is oceanic versus continental. There are very definitely oceanic arcs that bear some of the, the cumulative behaviours of, of Andean margins. Um, and it's, it's harder to point your finger at continental margins that, that have the accretionary flavour, but I think um, there's a chance that Alaska behaves in that, in that way. And that's, that's pretty much the end of the story in terms of what I wanted to present today, except for one last point about, well, what precedes an Andean arc? Clearly the Andes wasn't, oh, sorry, um, South America wasn't always a big continental cratinized landmass. Here we've got a bunch of sections. Don't worry about the top ones. Just look at the old ones down here. This is 570 million years, and or well, basically through the, the Cambrian and the Ordovician. And what forms the, the upper plate to the Andes today got to be that way through its own period of creation. And we don't know very much about the metallogeny at this time because what's exposed or what's preserved these days is relatively deeply exhumed. But nonetheless, this thing had an accretionary history at one point in time. It wasn't always, it's not, not to say that it's some great old Archean craton that forms the upper plate. It's still, it's still a Paleozoic history. How long was it from this accretionary history to the onset of, I guess, let's call it the, the real Andean history? Somewhere in the range of 150 to 300 million years. In terms of geological proxies, what I observe in these rocks that I think is evidence of perhaps the closure and fusing of a lot of that um, upper plate permeability is amphibolite facies metamorphism and the generation of um, it's called an anorogenic or intracrustal magmas, of which you see quite a lot. There's a very distinctive event here in this part of the Andes at about 410 to 440 million years when there's lots of two-micron granites and those sorts of things um, in the basement. So. Overall, I think that there is a, there's a longer cyclical story here that the accretionary margins do eventually accrete to form continents. Um, and we might, we might be beginning to see some of that in the younger history. For example, on the, the eastern margin of Siberia, I held up the Central, Central Asian orogenic belt as a, as a classic accretionary margin. Well, most of that accretionary history is happening back here. And so how long do we have to wait before it behaves enough like a craton as an upper plate for an Andean margin to develop. And I think that's probably already happening um, from the kind of the middle Cretaceous onwards. Anyway, I'll leave it there.